I want you to uh, close your eyes and I want you to uh, picture this scene. God takes you by the hand and he leads you to a door. And behind that door is a room. And once you're in that room, you will achieve your heart's desire. In that room, your dreams, your wildest dreams will come true. In that room, you will get exactly what you want. And God places his hand on the knob, ready to open the door. And as he does so, you hesitate. And you say to God, what if I don't know what I want? Well, says God, that's for the room to decide. The room reveals all. What you get in that room is not what you think you wish, but what you most deeply wish for. And now as you stand in front of that door, you're faced with a disturbing truth. What if you don't want what you think you want? You can open your eyes. Now, this is pretty much the scenario which plays out in uh, what I haven't seen it, but I believe it's a, a strange sort of odyssey uh, film uh, from 1980 called Stalker. And a guy called Jeff Dyer wrote a book on the film and he draws uh, this conclusion. He says, not many people can confront the truth about themselves. He says, if they did, they'd run a mile they take an immediate and profound dislike to the person in whose skin they'd learn to sit quite tolerably all these years. I wonder if you would step into that room, knowing that what you think is your deepest desire isn't actually your deepest desire. And as Christians, uh, that really is a disturbing truth, isn't it? But if I asked you what your deepest desire is, you would probably know what the right thing uh, to say is. I started reading a book which I mentioned on, uh, on Thursday uh, called You Are What You Love. Uh, and the first question he asks is, what do you want? And uh, I actually made a note on this. Uh, and um, my note was along the lines of my, what I want more than anything is to live a life that's pleasing to God. Uh, that honours him. I want to, to, to live my life known, get to the end of my life and to be known as a, uh, as a man who loved his God. Uh, I want to uh, live a life where God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what I think I want, but I wonder if uh, that is really the truth of what I want. So uh, James Smith begins this book. He says, what do you want? That's the question. It is the first, last and most fundamental question of Christian discipleship. If you look in John chapter 1, he says, in the Gospel of John, it's the first question that Jesus poses to those who would follow him. When two would-be disciples who are caught up in John the Baptist's enthusiasm begin to follow, Jesus wheels around on them and pointedly asks, what do you want? And according to James Smith, the primary force behind our habits, and that's the purpose of his book, he's talking about the spiritual power of habits, which is why uh, we're looking at this as we begin this series on holy habits. The primary force behind our habits is not what we think, it's what we love. What we want most in life is the thing that we love most in life. And many of us, if not all of us, may be surprised to learn what we truly love the most. If God invited us to step into that room, uh, I wonder how many of us, myself included, would have quite a shock uh, at what is really in our deepest heart's desire. Now, remember the story of the rich young ruler. I, I keep coming back to this story because there was so much wealth uh, in this story and in fact in the man himself he came to Jesus asking about eternal life he thought that was what he wanted more than anything but you remember he left Jesus when he realized something quite tragic about himself and that was that he loved his wealth more than he loved his God 
And if you like, Jesus opens the door uh, to that room, doesn't he? Uh, when he says to him, you know, what is it? What, what is it you're looking for? And the man says, well, I've done this and I've done that, done the other. And so Jesus opens the door to that room and he says, well, I'll tell you what, go and give away all your wealth. And the young man goes away sad because he has great wealth and he goes away sad because he knows that he cannot give that up at that point in time. God desired for Israel to develop the right kind of habits. Uh, have a look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, where he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. So God wanted Israel to form the right habits. He says that, I want these commandments that I give you to be on your heart. When we learn something by heart, what we're saying, it's become a habit. If we learn a piece of music by heart, we do so as a process of habit so we can play it uh, without even uh, thinking about it. So Israel were to develop uh, godly habits, but the core driver for these habits was what? Well, he begins by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. God wants his people to live faithfully and to do so because they love him. The only way Israel was going to uh, take those commands to heart was if they loved God with all their heart, soul, and strength. And Jesus made that very clear to his disciples, didn't he, in John 14? He said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. So the ability to form godly habits, first and foremost, comes from knowing that we love God. We need to be mindful of a very important truth, and that is that there is a constant battle raging for our soul. The Bible talks an awful lot about spiritual warfare, and Satan presents to us these powerful rivals for our affection, those things which appear to promise fulfillment yet ultimately fail. The adulterous husband believes that the affair will give him the satisfaction missing from his marriage. The eager executive believes the promotion will give her the career fulfillment missing in her current role. The wannabe YouTube star believes his channel will give him uh, the popularity that's missing from his life. The shopaholic believes the next Amazon parcel will give her the buzz that's been missing since her last delivery. And the rival for our affections comes in the form of a promise, doesn't it? This is the basis of consumerism. It is the basis of advertising. The thing you don't yet have is the thing that will make you happy. That's what it all hinges on. The thing that you don't yet have is the thing that will make you happy. I've always wondered why uh, mil- some millionaires, uh, Chris Evans, the, uh, the DJ, uh, is, is a real petrol head. Uh, he really has a passion for cars. Uh, and I don't know how many he owns, but he has a fleet uh, of cars. And I've never really understood why I understand it, if, if it's a hobby or a curiosity or something like that. But for people who keep buying car after car after car and have a huge garage full of them, what is the driver for that, if you pardon the pun? Well, it's because you think uh, that Range Rover or that Jaguar or that Bentley, or that Lamborghini, that's the car that's going to really make me happy. The thing that we want most is the thing, whether consciously or not, will dominate our thinking, our time, and our energy. That is the thing that we love most. Whether we even want that to be the thing that we love most, it is the thing that dominates our time, our thinking, and our energy. Paul wrote to Timothy uh, with great sadness, do your best to come to me quickly for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me 
and has gone to Thessalonica. Now, Demas had been a trusted companion to Paul, and it's not clear here, because Paul doesn't elaborate, it's not clear if Demas abandoned faith and ministry altogether, or whether there was a particular pressure point uh, when he said, I can't do this. And Paul said, he's abandoned me because he loved this world. There was a rival for Demas's affections. And that rival was love for the world. And so this battle for our affections rages on. And sadly, tragically, in the case of Demas here, sometimes the enemy wins. Now, Jesus, of course, was no exception to Satan's temptations. In fact, he was the object of a sustained attack for at least three years of ministry. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 4. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now, in simple terms, the temptation came in the form of this. Satan said to Jesus, give yourself the thing that you desire most, because uh, Matthew here records quite uh, maybe obviously after 40 days and nights of fasting, Jesus was hungry. There's an understatement, if ever there was one. He was hungry. He cannot help but experience physical hunger. He has no control over that. So the devil comes to him and says, look, the thing that you desire the most, why don't you give yourself that thing? That is the thing that will truly satisfy you. But the devil clearly knew nothing about the Lord Jesus. Because Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, Jesus isn't simply quoting scripture, and he isn't simply standing firm on God's commands. He is showing us what he loves more than anything, not just the word of God, but the will of God. And there's a familiar incident uh, in John chapter 4 that will help illustrate this. Uh, John chapter 4, you will probably remember as the story of when Jesus speaks with uh, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. So it begins with a scene of Jesus resting beside Jacob's well. He's tired from a long journey and he's no doubt hungry again. And evidently the disciples have gone off somewhere to find uh, food, maybe accommodation. And then Jesus has this enlightening conversation with the Samaritan woman. We know uh, all about that. He tells her things about her life that uh, he couldn't possibly know. Uh, and uh, she's uh, astonished. And then the disciples uh, return to Jesus. And they say this to him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, well, could someone have bought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And this story helps us to understand a little bit more of what was happening in the wilderness when Jesus uh, said that man shall not live by bread alone. The devil said to Jesus, what you want more than anything is some physical food to satisfy your hunger. Hunger, But what Jesus wanted more than anything was to do the will of the Father. And that's because he loved the Father more than anything. You see the link back to Deuteronomy, that to take God's commands to your heart uh, is only possible when you love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your strength. For Jesus, not even physical hunger, intense physical hunger, could overshadow his love for the Father. And that's why the devil was unsuccessful in the wilderness. Not because Jesus kept quoting scripture, but because Jesus loved 
the Father more than anything else. And Satan could offer nothing in competition. Jesus was able to stand firm because he loved the Father with all his heart, soul, and strength. Now, over the next few months, we're going to be looking at these uh, holy habits. These are habits that were embraced by the church, the early church, and they are emphasized very much in the New Testament. But the reason I'm starting here by talking about loves is because we shouldn't suppose that simply learning these things will necessarily lead us to live out these things. Uh, this is not kind of a checklist. This is not a self-help study series. If we do this, 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 and this, uh, we'll be living righteously. And that's because we are what we love. And the journey towards a life that is fully in Christ involves a re-evaluation of our loves. And I speak very much to myself uh, as much as to all of you. I expect to be greatly challenged uh, as I consider my own loves in my own life. In short, we cannot begin to form holy habits if a life that pleases God is not the thing that we desire above all else. And I want to say, if you have any interest at all in living for God's glory, we sang earlier, didn't we? Living for your glory, take my life and let it be we need to think very carefully about our loves. Otherwise, these holy habits will be joyful or burdensome depending on how we're feeling at any given point in life. If we're feeling really encouraged in ourselves, then when we can open up again, we'd love to be uh, in the building fellowshipping together. But at those times when we're feeling a little bit low, then maybe the habit of meeting together isn't quite so appealing. I want us to close by reflecting on Psalm 37 verse 4. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. If we come back to that room, the only way to safeguard going into that room and knowing that the thing that you desire is the thing that you ought to desire is to take delight in the Lord. It's for him to be the sole object of our affection. Only then can we hope to have the right kinds of desires. Our aim should be to only want what God wants. That is the basis of faith. That's the basis of Christian submission, to acknowledge that God's will and ways are perfect. And that comes from delighting in the Lord, where he is the primary object of our affection. And as we work through some of the holy habits of Christian living, let us first ask whether our first love really is our first love.